Hey guys, Alexander Williamson here with the secret history inside of your aquarium. So a couple changes just in the last day. Um, you know, I witnessed these little ruby tetras, even though they're very teeny, they're smaller than most of the shrimp. I witnessed them eating copepods that were definitely within the range of baby shrimp. And even if they don't like swallow them whole, it appeared that they would be able to eat them or like pick at them. So that kind of had me worried. And right now the Endler actually, he is more concerned with something else. Like he's, I don't know what he's doing. He's just over here chilling. So I've got him in here and a female with him. Uh, actually, there's two females with him. They're both very young. They're like a month old. Picked them up at Aquarium Co-op in Edmonds. Um, really pretty fish. Just really young female. So um, hopefully that will work in my favor. It kind of worked out in this tank that that way I'll have only teeny fish. Um, you know, you can see here that the, the ruby tetras are like very small, very, very small. Uh, but they are feisty. So what I did is I went ahead and I built a rock uh, pile or a rock fort. And so when you do that, what you want to do is you want to get bigger rocks first. So like something like this that you can get some algae growing on um, and a biofilm on ideally. And I put those down first. And then I put in some Saswasserthong and then I put in some uh, Java gra uh, Java moss. I'm talking Jamaican Java mon. Uh, and then I piled more rocks, kind of like a lasagna or a layer cake, over that, so that you can see here. Let's pull you up top. You can see that here you got the mirror image, but underneath there, there's there's about four layers of rocks with java moss. So the, only the smallest copepods and pl plankton and bacteria will really be getting in there other than the baby shrimp. So the teeniest tiniest of the shrimp hopefully will survive because I had my razorback female uh, the other night. She gave birth to um, she gave birth to probably seven or eight that I counted in her uh, belly still or under her tail, I should say. Uh, and they're nowhere to be found, which isn't that alarming because they're so teeny. But I just wanted to make sure that they're not eaten right away. Um, she looks good. Oh, she's right back there. And she's got a new uh, saddle coming in. So she's going to be a quick producer for me. Now, what else you can do to protect baby shrimp? And this one is kind of controversial. A lot of people will do hang they'll hang tanks off the side like breeder boxes and stuff and i really don't like doing that just because it it uh kind of interrupts the nutrient flow and the cycles of that and you want your shrimp to not like freak out when they're pregnant so if you can see through the mesh here we've got a very pregnant female and the eggs have gone from that golden or green color that you see and they've turned to um, a darker grayish color or like almost like when you uh, see eggs getting uh, cooked in a copper pan and they oxidize and they have that kind of like slight green hint when you overdo them, something like that. Uh, it has that kind of uh, mossy green or sage green color mixed with a gray color. And you can actually see, I don't, it's probably worth zooming in. But you can see that she's got little critters stirring already. So she's going to be giving birth really soon. And she's just kind of zoomed right ahead of the other ones. I wasn't expecting that. I also went and made sure that I took the leaf litter. You can actually see the biofilm on it right here. You see that, um, like, the, the um, lighter colored stuff here versus, like, at the end of my fingernail, there's, uh, let's get that back to focus, there is uh, spots that have been munched on by the shrimp. So that's a biofilm. And then the other thing I did to make sure that we're getting lots of water in is I put it the, the hang off the back filter half and half so that the output is actually lined up with the, with the netting 
and so that we're getting some inflow into the netting rather than just and still current into the tank you can see flowing rather than this being in a dead zone over here or something now it's not super pretty but what I want to do is I want to get the baby shrimp established and maybe two or three weeks old and then let them out let the parents out right away and see how that goes see how the breeder box goes now let me take you real quick over here um, I have done the same thing for my blue dream shrimp and they seem to be taking it really well so they've yet to produce more than just a couple one-offs and so I planted some uh, dwarf hair grass and then I also planted um, hold on one sec let me try to remember the name of it um, we've got blah 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 um, so it's Cyprus uh, Heliferi or Heliferi um, and that's that longer grass it's kind of like dwarf you know dwarf uh, grass it'll be growing through the substrate but more importantly what we did is we took the Soswasser Tong same same deal we took some Monte Carlo and then we also took some dwarf baby tears and I don't have CO2 in this tank and everyone's like how's your dwarf baby tears living how's your um, how are your uh, crimson temple plants or uh, scarlet temple plants living the answer is I dumb luck a little bit but also probably just keeping it really oxygenated I do use uh, a little bit of liquid fertilizer but I try to keep my nitrogen right at the edge of like my nitrates at like 30 to 40 uh, and these shrimp are acclimated to that now I probably need to drop that down if you want your shrimp to breed but this tank has a great biofilm going. It almost is like a slight mucus. I have to keep it in check. I'm trying not to get the hair algae growing. But all behind this lower uh, stuff, you can see the fry, and it's, it's a real mix of plants, and we'll go into that in a future video. But it's a real mix of plants to, to keep your fry and your um, shrimplets safe. Now, you can also do that up top as guppies seem to be top water dwellers. Um, so a lot of times I'll float some things also for them. But with the shrimp, I'm really making a push to try to get them to uh, breed, especially because I've got nine of these beautiful um, blue cherry shrimp, or <laughs> blue cherry, uh, blue dream shrimp in here. And they're all so dark that... Uh, that you can almost not tell that they're blue. Uh, there's a couple that are turquoisey when they molt, but um, they're that really dark blue, and they came from a really good source that I trust has been keeping them isolated for years and years, probably seven years. So we've got a uh, Java Windelov variety that's kind of flayed, and that kind of slows down the adult endlers uh, and guppies from cruising in so they'll be able to get into like this area where those little minnows are now where the guppy fry are but they won't be able to penetrate down into that rock stack and along that cliff and i did the same thing here um a little less of a lasagna because of how much growth is going on here but hopefully between these big rocks and some caves that i fitted uh, under here where it's so tight against the glass you can't get to it and I didn't vacuum filter out that area and I haven't scraped the glass clear of algae here because the baby shrimp really need that um, plankton and algae and uh, all that kind of stuff to thrive um, just to set the tank off a little bit I put some cardinalis um, cardinal plant or lobelia cardinalis and some uh, What's the other one? I think it's called uh, Talanthera cardinalis. Uh, the Talanthera card cardinalis gets a little taller. But in any case, that's just to kind of make things pop. But as you see, the adults still have plenty of room to move. I've got the filter. This is an experiment. I've got the hang off the back filter with no carbon in it right now because I don't want to trap the good stuff. I just did a 30% water change and uh, we've got the filter kind of running and flowing lengthwise with a bubble filter sponge filter over here so the water's aerated from both sides 
and we've got um, kind of a wall or a shelf like you'd see in a stream in Taiwan. Um, I was looking at their geology and geography, and you can kind of see that my my uh, fry are swimming through there, and they're navigating it no problem. Uh, so the even smaller stuff should be able to get in the rock pile, like under here. They'll get through those cracks, and it's a maze, and they can kind of hide in there, um, hopefully, if they're, if they're smart. Quote, unquote, smart shrimp, as opposed to those non-smart shrimp. These ones went to college and got their degree. Uh, so here's an, an example. This is a topaz. Uh, variety. I've got the Blue Dream and the Topaz. I know I shouldn't mix them, I like technically, but um, they produce a really nice shrimp. So I'm gonna be calling it like a Blue Topaz Dream uh, since it is like that. Then we've also got the snail, the Malaysian trumpet snails, which uh, will go through the substrate and overturn everything really well. You can see they've been digging here. Um, and so that'll kind of help with the upkeep of how dense this is. You probably definitely want snails unless you've got a lot of shrimp. So I hope this helps uh, give you an idea of what I'm doing to get Endler and Guppy Fry as well as uh, Corydora Hybrosis out of the same tank. I took the Corydoras out of this tank. I don't want to make you guys sick, so I'll cover up the walking. And I, uh, I threw it in this big tank uh, in the 40 gal and I have put them in, uh, down, down in here. I've planted for them a little bit and they've had a complex of rocks for whoever wants to reproduce, but this tank gets hit with ferts a lot, lots of fertilizers. Uh, you can see the corridor hebrosis are running around like crazy. This tank is pretty full. It's, uh, it's, to its inch limit, it's definitely right there, plus some fry, but most of the fish are teeny little fish. And finally, we have some saddled uh, females. Uh, I think the main issue being that like this one, it was hard to see saddled because they're Sakura painted and you, you can't see through them. So um, that's what's going on here. We've got two different uh, species or subspecies or... I guess, varieties of, they're not different species, but varieties of um, guppy here. We've got this snakeskin pastel rainbow, and then we've also got a blue flame tail. Um, so we're breeding them with a, um, she is a uh, Dumbo-eared bluegrass. So we'll see what happens. It's kind of an experiment. We've also got some fry here that were from just like a Petco, like it, I was cycling the tank and ta-da, the female was pregnant. So we've got about 20 fry that are um, Petco surprises. When they grow up, I'm going to pull them out of this tank immediately. Um, they're probably going back to the pet store, to be honest. Um, but from there, then I'll have a good solid five lines of different fish that can breed in three different tanks, four of which are in this little mini tank over here, and then the other one, which is in this 20 gallon long over, over here. So I hope this helps you out with your breeding projects, and uh, I hope you guys are having a good weekend. Uh, this is Alex Williamson. If you've learned something, if you've liked something, if I've entertained you, uh, or if you want to get back at your father from some unresolved issues uh, where he wouldn't let you have fish, please like, comment, subscribe. And if you're feeling really feisty, uh, feel free to click on the link to uh, my Patreon page. It helps keep the lights on and it helps... Uh, keeping me bringing you guys new interesting stuff. You can see all the different plants and things, and we're going to be getting into that in the following weeks and months ahead. So buckle in. Uh, take care of your tanks. Take care of each other and yourselves, and have a great day. I'll talk to you later. Keep on swimming, guys. Bye.